I think it's um, uh, six years ago. Oh, it's developing very fast. I mean, there's quite a lot of uh, buildings in there. Another, uh, new buildings and so forth. Well, I'm here because I was invited. Um, and uh, it's the first time that I've been invited to such an event and it'd be nice to uh, attend. And I haven't got any expectations. I just want to meet um, the same kids and meet this Prime Minister or at least get a look, look at him. Very good, very good. Hello. Hello. Why is that not too bad? Thank you. 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 The Leeward Island People's Association's presentation tonight, our very special guest. Of course, we have the very honourable Dr. Denzel Douglas here in Manchester, I think for the second time. And um, it's an honour to have him here with his team. Um, of course, he's the Prime Minister of St. Kitts and Nevis, the Federation of both of those islands. So welcome, Dr. Denzel Douglas. A round of applause, please. Thank you. And as we go on, I'll just tell you a little bit about um, um, Dr. Denzel Douglas, just a little bit of his history. Dr. Denzel Douglas was born the 14th of February, 1953, and he's been the Prime Minister of St. Kitts and Nevis since July 1995. He leads the St. Kitts and Nevis Labour Party and is both the longest serving national leader and since 2012, the longest serving head of government in the Americas. Douglas studied medicine as a young man. He obtained a Bachelor of Science degree in 1977 and a degree in medicine in 1984 from the University of the West Indies. And in 1986, he established a private medical practice as a family physician and served as president of the St. Kitts Nevis Medical Association in the late 1980s. We do need the national anthem, yes, thank you. <laughs> One, two, three. Oh, land of beauty, our country where peace abounds, thy children stand free on the strength of will and love. With God in all our struggles, Thank kids and Nevis be a nation bound together with a common destiny. As stalwarts we stand for justice and liberty with wisdom and truth. We And um, earlier this year, the Prime Minister started uh, visiting with many of our nationals around um, the UK, in the United States, let's say North America, in, in a process of engagement and information sharing. Um, and I think it's an opportunity for you to engage him to understand precisely what is going on in St. Kitts. And I myself, I confess, I thought I knew a lot about what was going on in St. Kitts. But in the meetings that I have accompanied him, I've actually found myself making notes because I'm learning as well about St. Kitts and Nevis. I've ex exhausted my time, which is three minutes, and I'll turn you over to Mr. 
to Dr. Wilson. It's my first time in Manchester, and it's the longest that I have ever stayed in England, actually. I got here just about 8 a.m. this morning. And I am quite happy to see that we have such a wonderful turnout. My name is Dr. Norgen Wilson. I am a special advisor in the Prime Minister's office, the Anti-Crime Unit. It gives me great pleasure to be here, really, because in recent times, there have been lots of criticisms with regards to St. Christopher and Nevis, where crime is concerned. And so I am happy to be accompanying the Prime Minister this afternoon to try and enlighten our nationals here as to what the current situation is in St. Kitts and Nevis. But let me first say that my journey really began before I got to the policy-making bodies. My journey really began as a young man in the community of Sandy Point, St. Kitts, is there, or are there anyone here from Sandy Point? No one from Sandy Point. <laughs> um, you know, Sandy Point, we're a very proud people, and I never really saw myself as having the opportunity to sit with the policy-making bodies. However, my journey began in 1998 when the opportunity was granted to me to go abroad and further my studies in the area of medicine. I took the opportunity along with 22 other nationals and we went to, to Cuba. At the time, the government was opening scholarships for many of our young persons in the Federation, not only to Cuba, but to the United States, then Taiwan, also to the University of the West Indies and so forth. And young persons were basically grabbing at the opportunities. I saw the opportunity to study medicine, and I took that opportunity. After spending seven years in the Republic of Cuba, uh, becoming very fluent in Spanish, and so we returned happily from that group of the 23 persons which went into Cuba then, nine of us came home as general practitioners and one as a dentist. That's almost 50% of the group which came home in the medical field. We also had areas in engineering, um, architecture, and so forth. It was really up to persons which area they wanted to, or they chose to specialize in. After spending uh, about three years in the emergency, well, three years in medicine, just about six months in the emergency department, I decided that I wanted to serve my community, Sandy Point, and I applied for um, the post of district medical officer, which I did for another two and a half years. The thing about being a medical doctor, people not only come to see you because they're ill, People sometimes go and see the doctor because it's someone that they confide in and do express a lot of the problems and issues. When I learned that the government was really embarked or embarked on a program where it continued to send more and more young persons abroad to, to become young professionals within the Federation, I then recognized that in order for me to actively participate in changes within the Federation, I could not sit down just as a medical doctor, and so I decided to enter into the policy-making bodies. Firstly, I associated myself and I, I joined up with the St. Kitts Nevis Defense Force, where I entered into the officer's training program, so I entered into security. Still actively participating in medicine, and finally, I became very close with um, the government in the sense that I really wanted to effect change within the Federation. That is why today I am actually a special advisor in the Ministry of National Security, the anti-crime unit of the Office of the Prime Minister. Several years ago, many of you may have been hearing that um, violent crimes in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis had been spiraling upwards, and the government really needed to take serious actions to bring it down. We went about by changing some of our policies and as well as 
change in our management in that area. When compared to 2010, the 2011 statistics or the 2012 statistics really showed that there has now been a 53% decline in crime. That's the bottom line. The private sector has been far more cooperative with the government. The, the policies and the actions which has been taken by the government have made this or caused a, practically a U-turn. Well, St. Kitts is where I was born, I'm not going back. I went there last year, um, I had to go back for tragic circumstances. And with regarding the police, I must say I'm a bit disappointed with the way how the police treat nationals. Now, I know everybody wants to, everybody would love to go back home and stay, but when they do, they don't get treated like the nationals that has not come away from St. Kitts. And I want to know what, if anything, is going to be done to address that. Not only, it's not only just the citizens, but I find people in government as well. We are actually treated differently. And especially, and the police are just something else. You go there and... As soon as they hear your accent, they don't think that you were actually born there and you belong there. They just treat you as, don't go there. And I think that's something for us wanting to go back. We need that to be addressed. That's all I want to say. Let me say that the society needs to be educated because the government really has gone out of its way to invite returning nationals to our country. <laughs> and we did create, at one stage, the Returning Nationals Association, which is still there and functioning. And there's also the Returning Nationals Secretariat in the office of the Prime Minister that deals with matters pertaining to returning nationals. I know that some of you would have been called English and things like that, and you don't like it because you're not English. You are really um, Caribbean Kittisha Nivisha. And I know some of you have been insulted in that way. But for, but for the police to treat you differently, that is serious discrimination, and it needs to be lodged um, officially I would think, into this returning national secretariat or the chief of police inform. And this is something that we have to work on. One of the big problems that we're facing globally is the cost of energy. One of the champions in St. Kitts and Nevis in terms of bringing new technology, new um, applications, new resources um, to St. Kitts and Nevis is our current um, Deputy Prime Minister who, is, who has that portfolio. He has also been the Minister of Health. I must say it is quite a pleasure for me to be in Manchester and to see such a large gathering here this evening. It's really heartwarming. I want to thank you for coming out. I want also to recognize the members of the press, because it's so important for them to be here, to be able to disseminate what exactly would have been said, and to use all the various social media. I want, first of all, to basically give a, a brief overview of myself, because I don't think most persons would have actually known me. I, too, is also a medical doctor, having trained also in Havana, Cuba, just like my colleague, Dr. Norgen Wilson. I went to Cuba to study medicine from 1982 to 89, and having graduated in 89, I returned to St. Kitts at that time, wasn't able to get a job with, with, with the said government at that time, but able to go into private practice in February of 1990. And having been in practice for almost two, two, probably two years, 
I was then asked by the leader, Dr. Denzel Douglas, that if I would want to get involved in, in politics. I then asked myself, why me? Having just graduated from medical school and having returned, having been trying to establish a private practice, but then I realized the need and the opportunity to serve my people at a higher level. I was first elected to Parliament in 1993 as an opposition member. Then in 1995, again, when the Labour Party formed the government, and having formed the government, I was appointed the Minister of Health and Women's Affairs. Up until, and then in 2000, up to 2004, I became, when I won the election again, was appointed Minister of Health and the Environment. And 2004 until 2013, being appointed as the Minister of Housing, Public Works, Public Utilities, and Energy. And most recently being appointed, within the last two months, the Deputy Prime Minister of the Federation of Sinkets and Nevis. I want to... I want to, as I will normally do, is to thank my good people in East Bastia, because I represent East Bastia. That is from Fort Street all the way over to the Southeast Peninsula. And I want to thank those persons for having the confidence in me, for having elected me in 93, 95, 2000, 2004, and 2010. I want to thank them because without their confidence in me, I would not have been able to be here where I am today. So I always thank those persons of East Bastia for having that confidence in me. And two, with that confidence, that's the reason why I'm here as a Deputy Prime Minister. So I want to thank them, as usual. I want to get in basically to look at the aspects of my portfolio. Basically, housing, public works, public utilities, and most critically in all of that, the issue of energy. I want to say that over the last 17 years, the government of St. Kitts and Nevis, the Labour government, has started a social revolution in housing. We have built almost 3,000 houses over the last 17 to 18 years. We established a national housing corporation and through the National Housing Corporation, we were able to build low and middle income homes for our citizens in the Federation. Linked to that closely, there's a program that we call the Civil Service Program, where persons in the civil service, based on the amount of time they would have served in the service, can use their gratuity as a means of securing loans from the from our development bank in assisting them in constructing homes. That's not a program that the government establishes as a means of assisting those in the upper income area that can access funding from the, from the, develop, from the various funding institutions basically to assist in the construction of the homes. We also started recently a program through the SID of the Sugar Industry Diversification Foundation where we felt that we had seen a reduction in the, con in the construction industry and the SID have provided funding through some of our local institutions, for example, the credit unions, our development bank, the FINCO, as a means of providing low interest rate funding, which is about 5%, as a means of stimulating the construction industry. Out of that, I am told, we, had, we have almost 300 houses being constructed over the last two years, specifically out of that program, where we had a reduction. Normally, interest rates in the banks are probably 8 to 9%. The SIDF came in, and we were able to reduce the interest rate to 5%, and we have more people building, being able to build homes. It serves as a catalyst because, from all indicators, construction is one of the major planks in the development of the country, and we wanted to stimulate that as a means of moving, moving forward. What we have seen, basically, in the construction of houses is a complete revolution. We have seen persons in Sinkis who basically didn't think of the opportunity, or even thought of the opportunity of having a home. 
We have moved people from a situation where they would probably have a house in the yard, the kitchen in the yard, the bathroom in the yard, and move them into a house where they have basically all the basic amenities inside of that home. That is the social revolution that we are speaking about. That is the movement we are, we are speaking about. That is the empowerment of our people in the Federation that we have brought about over the last 17 years. What this has basically done, it has created wealth for ordinary people in the Federation. You know, being able to use that house, that land, as a means of equity to provide assistance for your children to go abroad for studies. I'm glad you mentioned about all the way of well looked after in the country. And uh, it is very important, sir, that they are happy and healthy, so the whole family is happy. So it's very important for the first of you, you must do your best to look after them. The other major challenge in infrastructure, as was as is indicated by the High Commissioner, is the issue of the cost of electricity. And I must say that this is a challenge for all countries of the Eastern Caribbean. St. Kitts is no exception. Probably the only country that is not being challenged at this moment by the high cost of electricity is Trinidad. Trinidad being a producer of fossil fuel. Probably one of the cheapest places in the whole region that you'll find electricity. Most of us in the Eastern Caribbean, from Jamaica up in the north, or Bahamas up in the north, to Guyana, way down in the south, excluding to Trinidad, we are all challenged by the high cost of electricity. I want to spend a few minutes to outline these in detail in terms of what we are doing. The reason why I want to spend a few minutes, because the cost of electricity has a direct impact on basically everything that takes place in our homes today. Not in all in our homes, but in our factories. It affects business, it affects industry, it affects the tourism sector, it affects everything. Virtually everything in your home now operates on electricity. The computer, the games, everything and everything. And uh, that is why it is a major challenge for us uh, as a people. As I indicated earlier, we want to look at wind, solar, geothermal, and waste to energy. We have recently been negotiating with a company out in North America by the name of North Star for the establishment of a five megawatt wind farm in the Bellevue area. Those negotiations are ongoing and we expect that once they would have completed, we will see the establishment of a wind farm in, in Sinkets. I am glad to report that in Nevis, on the other hand, they have already constructed a wind farm that has been operating there for almost two years now and assisting in the generation of renewable energy there for the people in Nevis. In the area of solar, we expect in solar, we just recently, with the assistance with the Taiwanese government and the Sugar Industry Diversification Foundation and the Ministry of Energy, just had the groundbreaking ceremony about two months ago for the construction of a one megawatt solar farm on the airport. That will assist in the generation of electricity for the, for the airport and help in the reduction in terms of the operation costs of, of the airport. I guess the question will be asked, well, what about our consumers, our local consumers? Between the Ministry of Energy the Sugar, the Sugar Industry Diversification Foundation and the Sinkits Electricity Company, we have come up with a program linked to conservation in a means of assisting our local consumers who are burning between zero to almost a thousand kilowatts of energy per month. The program basically is linked to conservation. At the moment, consumers who are consuming between zero to 250 kilowatts of energy per month, basically not pay any surcharge. What this arrangement will be doing for those consumers is assisting them in the reduction in their basic cost of electricity. It means, therefore, the less you burn is the more subsidy you will be actually getting from this SIDF 
and Skellig and the government arrangement. It means that we are challenging you to conserve. I remember when I, when I went around to Leeds and Manchester, I, I, I said to people, if you ever remember me for one thing, I want you to remember me for this. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Leader, you remember me saying that? When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Um, you have heard the, the introduction of the Prime Minister, and that is the side of the Prime Minister that you know, you see it in the papers. But I just want to introduce a, a brief side of the Prime Minister that perhaps you haven't heard enough of, and which you should hear. I just returned yesterday with the Prime Minister from Barcelona, where he went to address the 10th anniversary to commemorate the, the AIDS conference which was held in Barcelona in 2002, I think. <clears throat> and as we were having the discussions we were going around um, Barcelona, um, I, I noticed that your Prime Minister, my Prime Minister, is hailed in, in Spain and different parts of the world for the work that he has done for HIV AIDS internationally. Our Prime Minister, your Prime Minister, my Prime Minister, negotiated with the help of President Clinton and um, a regime which now affords people in, the, people in the Caribbean who are HIV infected to get all the necessary antiretroviral drugs for only 300 US or less than 300 US per year. In Spain, where the government subsidizes it, they're paying 9,000 euros per patient in the Caribbean, thanks to the, the, the efforts of our Prime Minister, it's less than 300 US dollars. And that, that is celebrated in Spain, but we, I never hear it discussed in the discourse that we have in the Caribbean. And I just thought it's, it's important for us to say that. Um, last year, I recall receiving a letter asking if the Prime Minister would be willing to travel to Japan to discuss at the, at the Commonwealth Finance Minister's meeting um, the, the best practices, the expertise, the skills the, that he used to negotiate or renegotiate the debt for St. Kitts and Nevis. Prime Minister Douglas was asked to chair that meeting as a result of, of how he has managed to transform the financial landscape of St. Kitts and Nevis. This you do not hear, but I thought it's important that I share it with you. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. <clears throat> also, in 2011, <clears throat> in my first year, I accompanied the Prime Minister to Perth, Australia, where you had the heads of government of the Commonwealth, 54 countries. Prior to that meeting, he was invited to be a guest, a keynote speaker, at an economic forum in Australia to talk about economic development and investment in the Caribbean. The Prime Minister also holds the portfolio within the Caribbean for health. And this is also why in 2011, with the help of the Prime Minister and the work that he had been doing with his CARICOM colleagues, we were able to have in September of 2011 at the United Nations a high level discourse on non-communicable diseases, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, um, cancers. These, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Also, um, how many of our leaders in the Caribbean are members of the Queen's Privy Council? Your Prime Minister is the Right Honourable Prime Minister. I think we need to introduce into the discourse these kinds of elements so that we recognize when we have the sons of our soils who have risen and have done so much, we need to celebrate and to thank them. It, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to the mic and to you, your Prime Minister, my Prime Minister, our Prime Minister, the Right Honorable Dr. Denzel Douglas. I want to thank um, our High Commissioner, Dr. Kevin Isaac, for his very kind words. And um, I'm wondering whether after all of those accolades, 
he should not get an increase in his salary. <laughs> My very dear and good people of Manchester, permit me, of course, to adopt the protocol that has already been established. And let me, in my own way, welcome you to this town hall meeting that has been so ably organized by the Leeward Island People's Association and, of course, headed by our president. Let us give her a tremendous round of applause <laughs> together with the people who have assisted her in making today's arrangement possible. I want to also thank you for being here. Thank you for the opportunity for me once again to visit Manchester and to lead a delegation so that we can keep our people not only of St. Kitts and Nevis informed, but also bring information to the people of the Leeward Island who may be assembled here in this hall. But I also would like to speak to the people of the world, especially our own nationals, who by virtue of the modern technology that now exists in communication, they are possibly either directly listening to this meeting taking place here in Manchester, or who may later this evening, with the use of um, Chris's radio station and others of the media who will bring this to our people, would soon be much attuned and aware of some of the matters that we have been discussing here today. I want to say to you as I begin that, as the High Commissioner indicated, we are on our way really from Spain. We were in Barcelona, Spain, um, Catalonia in particular, in Spain for the last few days. And we thought that since we are going to be close to the United Kingdom, we should not waste an opportunity, an opportunity to speak to our people who are of St. Kitts and Nevis origin. I wanted also to introduce to you, myself, my new Deputy Prime Minister, the Honorable Dr. Earl Asim Martin, who spoke to you a moment ago. Give him a tremendous round of applause <laughs> for not only speaking to you so well, but also for taking on the challenge of assisting in leading our country through the new economic development program that we are pursuing at this time that eventually would lead to a new society in St. Kitts and Nevis, a new country and the people at the end of the day who would be much better on. And that's what I want to speak to you about this evening. Our new economic program that we're pursuing in St. Kitts and Nevis, given the global challenges that we are facing, global economic and financial challenges, and how at the end of the day this is going to produce a new society where the people of St. Kitts and Nevis will be seeing themselves in a different way, a better way. And at the end of it, we would have created, not only for ourselves, those of us who are living in St. Kitts and Nevis, but those who are living abroad, and those who would wish to visit us from time to time, we would be creating as well a new and better country for all of us. Why do I say that is the question you must be asking yourself this evening. Firstly, I want to go back to when we took office 
in 1995. The Labour government was created, this new modern Labour government was created in 1995 on the 4th of July after a general elections of the 3rd of July 1995. This is the second Labour administration in modern times to be looking after the affairs of our country, St. Kitts and Nevis. You would be familiar with the first Labour administration that was led by the Labour movement in the earliest of the colonial days, back in the 1940s and 50s, after the party was created in 1932. It was then called the St. Gis Nevis and Guerrilla Workers League. It was created in 1932, almost 100 years after the freedom of our people by way of emancipation, when our people no longer were called slaves, but who once again would have been free people, remembering the freedom that their ancestors enjoyed when they were in motherland Africa. And our party, the St. Kitts Nevis Labour Party, was created in 1932, 100 years after the abolition of slavery in 1833. And eventually, after a period of what we called um, stipendary learning exercises, we eventually had full freedom in 1838. And our party was really created 100 years. We had adult suffrage, you would recall, in 1952-53 or thereabout. Fifty years after, in 1980 plus, that's when we began to recognize our independence. Because in 1983, under the leadership of the right excellent Sir Robert Sir Kennedy Alphonse Simmons, we attained independence in 1830, 19. Um, 83, about 50 years really after the creation of the um, adult suffrage that we had won. And as I said, um, after um, our party was created in 1932. And so this is the second really labor administration that is looking after the affairs of our country. We lost power, you would remember, in 1980. The Labour Party lost governmental power in 1980. And then after a period of 15 years in opposition, we then returned to power in 1995. And by the grace of God, we are still here looking after the affairs of the people of St. Kitts and Nevis in a new second labor, um, um, labor dispensation. And so I want us really to look at where we were after taking office in 1995, when the people believed that after 15 years, the administration had not provided the kind of development, personal, people, national development that they expected, when corruption and craft had in fact superseded the interest of the people. And so the people voted overwhelmingly in 1995 to bring a new dispensation. And so this present Labour administration took office. 
From the very beginning, there was Dr. Asim Martin, who in 1995 became our first Minister of Health in this new Labour Administration dispensation, and who since then has held several portfolios, in particular the portfolio of um, works, housing, infrastructural development to a large extent, and as you've heard, is now leading in the revolution, the green revolution that is taking place in St. Kitts and Nevis as we move our country away from dependence upon fossil fuel energy to one dependent upon renewable energy, green energy, so that at the end of the day, we would have preserved our country, not only for this present generation, but for the generations in the future, where the environment would have been preserved after a government would have instituted very carefully sustainable development policies and programs that will preserve not only Mother Earth, but our own ancestral home, St. Kitts at Nevis. So I want to say that this march towards the creation of a new society began in 1995. We've had several setbacks during this long journey to creating a better society for our people. We built a number of homes for our people, as he indicated to you. Our people largely were homeless. Homeless in the sense that they did not live on the streets, but they were paying rents. Other, people's, other people owned their homes, and they paid rent for them. They were almost, as I said, a, group, a, a class of people who did not have the dream of owning their own property. But we made it possible because from 1995 until today, a housing revolution that we started has continued. Over 3,000 houses have been built for our people. And when you consider that each home would have a family of about four members, it tells you that we would have empowered no less than about 1,200, 12, sorry, 12,000 people in St. Kitts and Nevis in a population that is only 50,000 people. That is why we say it is a revolution. Not only that, but we have made sure that we have allocated in special land distribution initiatives in the last few years in particular, over 5,000 house lots for our people, especially on the closure of the sugar industry in 2005. We decided that the people must be allowed the opportunity to own the land. And we pursued an initiative where every single household, every family, was entitled to a residential house lot. 4,000 4, square feet at least. And of course, if you wanted more, you would pay $3, $4, or $6 per square foot if you wanted to get more than that. Today, as I said, we have continued the distribution of land in what we consider to be the People Empowerment Program, where people must be able to own land and in owning land, they will become potentially wealthy because they would have now owned property which they can do a number of things with, as the minister told you a while ago. Use it as collateral to send their children off to universities, go to the banks and start up their own businesses using the value of that land to ensure that they can move from a state of abject poverty to one of working class,
from working class to the middle class and from the middle class to become the wealthy people if they wish to become wealthy by future investment in themselves and of course in their children who we believe must be able to move up the social ladder and thus enter into the economic spheres where they can improve themselves generally and that of their families. So I want to say that that was one area that we concentrated on. We had a number of things taking place in the country, education, home improvement, home development, land distribution, the infrastructure of the country was being built, new hospitals were being built. In fact, our hospital was destroyed, main hospital was destroyed on St. Kitts back in um, 1998, I think it was. It had to be rebuilt. Now we have a modern Joseph and France General Hospital. Since then, we've also rebuilt the hospital in Sandy Point, a brand new hospital we built only about three, four years ago, and we will continue to improve generally the health of our people by way of providing medicines, improving the basic services to improve infrastructure, and thus empowering our people with regard to health and medical services. But I want to say that, especially after the closure of the sugar industry, we found ourselves with very many serious challenges. You would recall that we pumped uh, millions upon millions of dollars back into the sugar industry from 1995 until 2005, 10 years, because we were following a World Bank report that indicated to us that if we were able to put so many acres of land on the sugarcane cultivation, we would be able to at least reap crop that would provide us 30,000 tons of sugar. And the report told us that we were able to produce 30,000 tons of sugar and sold that to England here. We would be able to break even and the sugar industry would be able to survive. I want to report that after 10 years, we recognize that the sugar industry was not going to survive. It had become more and more indebted. And what took the final decision really to us was when the WTO, the World Trade Organization, had declared that the arrangement that we had with Great Britain, United Kingdom, to sell our sugar at special preferential price rates that that was inimical to fair trade, and that it was illegal, and that arrangement had to come to an end. That's when we realized that we could not compete with regard to the sale of our sugar with other countries like India and Bangladesh and countries in Central America where the labor in the sugarcane fields was almost slave labor. That could not happen in St. Kitts and Nevis because we had a vibrant trade union, St. Kitts and Nevis Trades and Labor Union, part of the labor movement, that ensured that the workers' conditions improved every year, those who were working in the sugar industry. There had to be an improvement in their wage level every year. They had to be properly compensated every year. And having those kind of expenditures, we realized it was not possible to compete with countries where workers in the sugarcane estates there were being paid little or nothing for their labor. And so we decided that we had to close the industry because it had chalked up too much debt. When we closed the industry in 2005, it had already chalked up $400 million worth of debt. And all that money was, in fact, being loaned to us by one or two institutions, mainly the National Bank 
of St. Kitts and Nevis. We therefore decided that we had to do something about the industry and we took a very bold and unprecedented decision to close the industry in 2005 and thus set our country on a new path to economic development. It is this new path for economic development that I want to say to you that it is working and eventually I believe we are going to be a better people, a better country, and a better society. What really is this new economic development program that we are pursuing? Firstly, we had to come to the realization that the way we were doing business, the way we were financing government operations had to be rebalanced. We had a very wide fiscal deficit. The amount of money that the government was spending every year was much more than what the government was receiving. It meant, therefore, that we had to borrow in order to meet the specific demands of our people by way of providing them services. There are certain basic things that the government must do for its people. It has to provide health care. It has to ensure that the people are educated. It means, therefore, teachers have to be trained. They have to be sent abroad to get the university training if they are not going to be trained at our own local community college in St. Kitts and Nevis. It meant that the elderly people had to continue to have their medicine. But it speaks to more than that. It speaks to a better people, a better country. It speaks to also providing financial support in continuing the initiatives of the police, of the defense force, in making sure St. Kitts and Nevis is a safer and a much more secure country so that our people can live in peace and harmony and investors are no fear to come without the fear of high crime levels in our country. It speaks of the elderly woman. Even though she has a chronic illness, she's been assured that she will receive her medication. Her diabetes will not go out of control. Her high blood pressure will be controlled. She's the able, the young lady who can develop cancer of the cervix and of the breast would be able to go to the, health, the, health, the hospitals and the diagnostic centers and have early detection so that the quality of her life can be improved, even though she may be diagnosed with a malignant disorder. It means that our children would receive the support that they require, even though they are from poor families. Their mothers, their fathers don't have any bank accounts. But the government will be able to provide them with student loans so that they can go off to university and they can come back as professionals and they can leave this new country, St. Kitts and Nevis, that we are created not only for them, but for the generations that are yet to come. This is the new society that I'm speaking of. We want to make sure that our ordinary people, every single family in every island, St. Kitts and Nevis, would understand the importance of investment, would be able to buy shares on the Eastern Caribbean Stock Exchange, thus, to a large extent, investing in the future and in the future of their proud children. This is the new society. This is the new country that we are trying to create. Mind you, we have challenges, we have problems. But we believe that if the people are united, 
and they understand the path that they must take to our development in the future, they can achieve whatever they have set their minds to achieve. I say finally that I'm very pleased for the last 17 years to have led our country for periods of good and challenge. I continue to commit my service to the people of St. Kitts and Nevis. I do not intend to die in office. And so my party is presently undergoing the appropriate succession plan so that we will be able to hand over the leadership of our country from one person to the next, but with the Labour Party in control. God bless you. Thank you. Okay, by being the first black Caribbean leader to receive the Gandhi King Aikido Peace Award. So well done. <laughs> I'm really aware of the time. Um, it's approaching 9 p.m. We do need to have a questions and answers time um, that I omitted on the uh, if it didn't print. So we will obviously be doing that. Yes. I spoke to you some time while I was down there and we were ready on regarding this bank of cuts. And you never get the chance to come back to me. So I would like you to show some light on that matter for me, please, by Mr. Because I think it's full time that those people who have that money in their position that It's time to let the people It's time to let the people have that money what belongs to them in that land. Everyone, my name is Mary Chapa Chapa and good evening Prime Minister and the panel. My question is you touched on housing. I would like to know what protection does the government give to house owners on the island of St. Kitts and Nevis? For example, safety, right? A few years ago, I was in Barbie, um, the Bahamas, and a lot of protection was in place for the protection of property. From the golf balls, and I know this is a, a particular problem in on some kids, where a number of houses in the Frigate Bay area have been inundated, I would say, with golf balls, to the dangerous <coughs> situation where it has now become out of control. And I would like to ask the panel, including um, the Prime Minister, what steps are being taken in order to protect the residents um, from this type of harm? Thank you. Uh, maybe I can begin to answer some of the questions. The, the Bank of Commerce issue, um, it is a very long uh, matter that needs to be settled. The government has intervened in the matter and we were informed late last year that it was going to be possible to sell some more property that the Bank of Commerce had owned and to make sure that the depositors that they would have been able to have returned to them some of their depositors. Um, the government has an interest because, as you would know, quite a bit of government money was also deposited and held by the bank, especially money from Social Security. I am not certain, as I speak, why the matter was not <coughs> finalized. But I promise that I would again 
um, pursue this matter. In fact, we had actually set a date when persons would have received, begun to receive their deposits. I am not certain what has delayed it. And to some extent, I have not, I will not be able to sit to you tonight, but I promise I will be able to get in touch with you. I'll get your name privately afterwards and see if I can deal with this matter for you. I am not certain if it is just simply the deposit that you would have had that is a problem or there are other related matters pertaining to it. But I will definitely want to assist in this regard. Thank you, sir. I spoke to the gentleman. The lawyer? Yes. I spoke to him. And he told me is enough money is there in the, to the bank yes. to pay everybody out. Right. Right? And I spoke to him before I leave Sinkit about two to three years ago. Yes. So I want to know why he don't pay this money out. What are you waiting for? Okay. What are you waiting for? Till everybody die to get and then the money sell it? It's time he paid that money out. Right? Right. The, I think the matter the matter became complicated because the lawyer who was working on behalf of the government and who naturally also would be working on your behalf because once we settle, that is the government settles and gets its money, the other depositors would have had the opportunities to get their money. I cannot remember as I speak to you why it was not paid, but you are right in the sense that a date was actually set when the bank's lawyers and the accountant general, who is the receiver, would have been able to settle on this. I really am unable to tell you now what is the reason, but I definitely would like to give you the answer after tonight. Right, he is the, he is the receiver. Anthony is the lawyer for the government, that's correct. He promised this matter would soon come to our test when I was in Singapore looking out for my parents. It's about time, Prime Minister, this matter should be come to an end. I agree with you. I agree with you. And we will do our best to get the information to the High Commissioner's office so that you can get an update as to exactly what the issue is. Um, speaking to the Prime Minister, you know, I listen to it. Um, let me um, tell you my name first. My name is Franklin Weeks, born in Davis, and I work in St. I listened to you carefully when you were speaking, Prime Minister, and you were talking about pension. And you know, pension is very important in our, um, our lives. But if I noticed that you only mentioned um, the people that in government work, when they're in retirement, they get a pension. What about those who are employed by the people that who have their own um, business? Do they entitle to a pension when they retire as well? Because I didn't hear you say anything about those people. Okay? Right. Pension issue. This is a very, very important matter, and I, I really should have mentioned it when I was speaking. Not only have we secured the rights of the non-established worker, previously called, now called the government auxiliary employees, to get their opportunity, etc., but we have just, as a government, decided that all workers in the country who do not have private employment arrangements for pension would become entitled to such. We have taken this as a policy decision in the cabinet and I believe if our parliament was not the way it is at the moment, it would have already been executed. But I want to thank you for reminding me because I have actually made a note of it and it slipped me in passing. 
and you're right. Because let me tell you how this has arisen. We have a number of these same ladies working on the industrial estates, the manufacturing, in electronics. Some of whom have been working in those factories for 30 years. 30 years, 25 years. And they are reluctant to leave. Because if they leave at this stage, there's nothing to get. They just simply would have gone. And we are saying that they should be entitled to some form of gratuitous payment, having served in one establishment for so long. And so we are going to legislate it. We are going to make sure that there is money provided for, for these persons eventually to have been able to move on. And in moving on, they can take something, a package with them. They would always get their pension from the Social Security because they are paying into the Social Security Fund. So at age 62, when they retire, they will get their pension. But to leave the job now, to go to a different form of employment, they get nothing if they leave now and they want to leave. Something, um, Prime Minister, you yes. in this country, when we are um, employed by um, anyone and we work there for three, four years, our pension follows anywhere we go and get another job. So when you reach retirement, you have something coming, and that is very good for the old ones when they finish right. work. Right. It's the same thing at home at the moment. They are entitled to a social security pension. So that moves with them, irrespective of the employer. What we are trying to introduce is a gratuity that they should be entitled to, what we call a long service gratuity. That if you work for someone or em employment for 10 years and you want to now move to a different form of employment, you should be able to get a gratuitous payment in moving. That's what we will legislate. Um, I'm not petitioned by birth, but I'm petitioned by citizenship and I'm very proud of it. And you're doing an excellent job for the Labour Administration. So, you know, there's a lot of things going on at the moment, but just keep praying and God will strengthen you. Uh, I've got two questions. Um, I recently read online um, in St. Kitts that uh, the Labour Administration is actually thinking of recovering land that was purchased on the Special Land Distribution Initiative um, when the building or the building has not started yet. Can you confirm that this is true? And another thing about pension, because pension is very important, and I'd like to retire and, re and go to St. Kitts to live. However, uh, in this country we get an increase in our pension. But once you go to St. Kitts, it's frozen. That is a matter that I have been taking up for years with the British government. I have spoken to no less than two prime ministers about it. Both, um, um, what's his name before? Tony Blair, what's his name? What's... No, 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 no. Major. I've taken it up with Major before uh, Major left office. And we have also taken up the same matter with, um, with um, Tony Blair. What we have been told is that they will not do it. It will cost too much money because they would have to do it to all of the workers who would have returned to their homes in the Commonwealth. They talked about South Africa, um, Australia, what it would cost the British taxpayer if they were going to be able to do that. And so they have simply said it's going to be too costly. They just will not be able to do it. Of course, there's a new government now, maybe, with the continued pressure from your MP onto the government and from pressure from you onto your MP here, we can make the change. But the Caribbean governments have sat down with both major and with Blair on several occasions, and they have refused to budge. They began to give it to, I think, Barbados and maybe Trinidad, I don't remember, just two countries, Jamaica, and they said flatly, they're not going to do it for any other Caribbean country 
they'll have to do it to other Commonwealth countries and it is too expensive for them. So that is something I believe that would take lobbying of your MP if we are going to get any further with that. The lawyers, they have no respect for people. I have a case there which I paid him $750. And the case was sold out between him and the other lawyer. I was told that there is no case, you know. Let's give the question, please, Nelly. What's the question you'd like to ask? What I want to know, where can you go to get, to get some sort of satisfaction with these people? Because they're taking your money and they're not doing the work. I have a, a, a bill here for $1,700 and I paid him already $750. Okay. The last thing he says to me, I better get out the country and get, and get onto the, the, the first jet plane back to London. A lady said to me, I must report it to the police and she would come with me. So I want to know where I can go to get satisfaction. Okay, Mr. Herbert, thank you very much for that. You're welcome. The, 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 the matter of um, Mr. Um, Herbert speaking on the treatment of those in the legal profession, treatment of their clients, is a very, very serious charge that you have made here tonight because you have actually identified a practitioner in the job. When matters like these arise, there are two things that you can do. Firstly, there is the um, fraternity that um, seeks appropriate behavior and conduct of members of their profession. You have the Bar Association. And the Bar Association continues to speak of actually policing the necessary laws that the government has put in place to ensure that there are appropriate ethics in the profession. So that's one course of action that you have. Making a complaint to the president of the Bar Association, there is a disciplinary committee of that association that can take up your matter. That's one. Secondly, there is the attorney general or the minister of justice on the government side. I believe that if you were to go to the minister of justice, for example, he would be able to point you to the right source, and that would be, I'm sure, the Bar Association to take up the matter. The government also provides support services for those who are unable to pursue matters like these in the court. We have what is called um, government support services paid for by the government. We have um, a unit in the Attorney General's chambers, also working closely with the Office of the Prime Minister, that will provide support without fees for those persons who feel that they have been wronged in this way and cannot afford to pay a lawyer to take up their cause. So I think you should pursue any of these um, three um, initiatives that are possible. Well, I've been to the Attorney General and he told me to go to the head of police. And I said, why should I? You didn't be in charge of him. No, he will not be in charge of him. The Attorney General will not be in charge of him. Of the police? Oh, of the police, yes, of course. Yes. Um, well, not directly, but... Um, he would be able to have access to the police. But you have to make the complaint. What I think he was saying is that it seems as though the gentleman has threatened you and you're also accusing him of robbing you. So that's a crime. You should go to the police. That's what I think he's telling you. Yes. Right. Is there any more questions to answer? Yes, there is. Um, the matter of the recovery of land under the Special Land Distribution Initiative when we allocated the land on the Special Land Distribution Initiative, you were to do some basic things. One of those things that you had to do was simply to make a down payment of $100 and to have your um, 
you survey, survey the land that has been identified for you, and then you begin to pay. Of course, if, and that was about three years ago, if you have not paid anything, you really stand the risk of losing the land because you may be saying then to us that you're no longer interested in the land. So if you're still interested, then probably you should go in. I don't think that if you have not built on the land, they can't take it away from you. I think it's because persons may not have paid more than the initial $100 in order to start the process to acquire the land. They cannot take the land from you if you have not built on it, especially if you have been paying for the land. It's a legal contract between you and the government, and you, 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 one party cannot just simply violate that contract unless the reasons are legal for the violation of that contract. The community um, gentleman here made his comment about the elderly. That's important. I think we, we, we need to understand that our party, the Labour Party, is not a socialist party, but it adheres to basic principles of human development and support. And so you can be assured that the Labour Party will always remain firm to these bedrock principles. It is to help those who are vulnerable and unable to help themselves. Poverty and um, age must not deprive you of what socially belongs to you. That's the basic principle on which the government operates as a party. The um, protection from the home. I'm a golfer myself, and I hope I am not guilty of throwing balls into your home. But um, I notice all along the golf course, there are signs which says to the golfer, that he is responsible if damage is done to any property along the golf course. Yeah. Why is that? Why the Yes. Yes. I, I think this is a very, very important um, comment that has been made. Um, we've done so much in support of the airlines that can provide direct flights from the United Kingdom into St. Kitts and Nevis. We've provided quite a bit of support as a government to make this possible. I believe what we're having here is the cost of um, fuel, that's one. We have been told that the cost of fuel is responsible, and as you know, I think that we ourselves com um, complain bitterly, campaign collectively as Caribbean countries to the British government when the APD tax was introduced. We told them it was going to create enormous difficulties for people who want to travel to our countries, the government at one time had said that they were going to remove the tax, and then there was a change in the government, and then the new government said they were going to study it, and then they implemented it, I think, last year. So, really, it's, 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 it's a combination of factors. I believe, however, that with more competition, the government has begun to um, consider its proposal to take to Virgin Atlantic, begin to negotiate so that maybe if there's competition, we might be able to bring the fares down. But we are working on it because we want you to come home. We, we love you being home. And so we shall try our very best to bring you home. Thank you. Yes. The, the matter of the earthquake, the report I've had um, yesterday when I received it this morning early, there was not any documented damage. It was five plus on which a scale, which is quite strong, but we have not had any 
formal reports of any damage, but it was strong. It was mainly, they said, a serious rumbling, and people felt it, three o'clock in the morning, but we have not had any formal report on any damage. Thank you for asking. Thank you very much. Um, like I said, and uh, I'm sure um, Dr. Denzel will come back with his team another time in Manchester. We've run out of time. The, the presentation was, you know, very good. It was a good uh, chance to hear the Prime Minister discuss Sinkit Navis. And uh, there was a pretty good crowd, in fact, really. I didn't expect you know, so many people to come. But yeah, you know, it, it was quite, you know, and he was quite, you know, you know impressive in what he said, really. Uh, I was glad to hear him discuss uh, the future of Sinkit Nevis and the things that they've put in place to uh, move the you know economy you know forward because we know you know as we know it's a, a world thing things has gone wrong in many countries concerning you know the you know economy and he said he, they are putting quite a few things in place to make things work. I was just concerned about the period of time they continue with the sugar cane, you know, concern before they actually take drastic, you know, you know, action and close it down, close it down and then close.